Welcome to Revelation VIB 406 lecture number five. We're going to continue in our discussion of the book of Revelation, and today we're going to jump into chapter six after we do a brief review of what we've covered so far. All right, so a recap of the chapter content, the previous chapter. In chapter five, we were introduced to the scroll and the one who is worthy to open the scroll. That was the big question. Um, chapter five, if you want to remember the content of that chapter, just think of a question mark. Chapter five equals a question mark. And that big question is who is worthy to open the book? And of course, the elders point us to Jesus Christ, who is the worthy one. Um, he is worthy to open the book. So we learned that there were seven seals closing up the scroll or the little book, um, which must be open. So in chapter six, we are going to see the first of those six seals opened up. So six seals will be opened up in chapter six. Okay, so before we jump into the six seals and the opening of those seals, I want us to first go and make a connection between the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation, especially the chapter that we are um, talking about here in chapter six. And this is a very important aspect of eschatology uh, for you to understand. If you've had uh, eschatology as a class in and of itself, you probably have spent some time already um, going through Daniel chapter nine. But for those of you maybe who haven't looked at this, I want to make an important connection here. So go to Daniel 9, and let's read the first part of this chapter. Daniel 9, verse 1, it says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. All right, so Daniel is able to basically um, figure out how long the captivity uh, of Jerusalem would, uh, the captivity of Israel rather, would last, uh, the destruction uh, of Jerusalem by Babylon. Uh, they were carried away, Daniel and his companions, to Babylon, and this was a direct judgment from God because of Israel's disobedience and rebellion toward him. And so Daniel was able to figure out how long this judgment is going to last. So he says that uh, he goes to the book of Jeremiah, and by studying the prophets, um, he is able to see that this judgment would be accomplished in 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem in chapter 9, verse 2. All right, so... This is tying into Jeremiah 25, uh, verse 11 through 13, and Jeremiah 29, 10. Uh, if you want to go back and look at those verses, it will give you some of the context here of what he's talking about, where Daniel was studying in the prophecies given by the prophet Jeremiah. All right, so seven weeks refers to 70 sets of seven years. So there, there is going to be a period of 490 years total that Daniel is uh, looking at here. Um, it is also clear that this calendar of events, um, it's focused upon the nation of Israel. So from the context of the chapter, from the book of Daniel, uh, from the prophecies given by Jeremiah, we understand that all of this is related to the nation of Israel. So um, it, would be, it, it would not be uh, proper for us to understand this timetable as dealing with anything other than um, the nation of Israel. And Daniel was told that 69 units of time will pass before the Messiah comes. All right, so this is clearly a reference to the coming of Christ to earth. Now, there is some disagreement as to exactly what event uh, fulfills this first, uh, these first 69 units of time. Uh, so basically, you've got a total of 490 years, the 70 sets of seven, and 69 units of those seven years are going to pass before Messiah comes. So you have a total of 483 years that will 
take place before the appearance of Messiah. And that leaves seven years additionally to add up to 490 total. So some say that the 483 years were completed at the birth of Jesus in 5 or 4 BC. Um, there is, however, little chronological um, support for that date. Other scholars, you know, biblical uh, scholars, would say that the 483 years were completed at his baptism, or some would argue for it being at the beginning of his ministry, um, if you dated that around 26 AD. Um, this is possible if you begin with the earlier decree um, from Artaxerxes and uh, figure out with our present measurement for years instead of the ancient measurement of years, 360 days as opposed to 365 days. Uh, others would argue that the 483 years were completed at the triumphal entry of Jesus. Um, you've got some would argue for that. Uh, of course, you've got uh, this difference between the 360 day year and the way we calculate years. So, for instance, Walverd, who uh, wrote our textbook, um, he's talking about an argument made. Uh, by a guy named Sir Robert Anderson. He says, Anderson, using a 360-day year, uh, which Israel used in Daniel's day, calculates 173,880 days from the decree to go back and rebuild Jerusalem to the triumphal entry, fulfilling the prophecy to the day. Uh, it is customary for the Jews to have 12 months of 360 days each, and then to insert a 13th month occasionally when necessary to correct the calendar. Uh, so he's basically making an argument for the 483 years being fulfilled from the decree uh, given to go back and rebuild Jerusalem up until the triumphal entry of Jesus you know, coming into um, Jerusalem on riding on uh, the donkey and on you know, Palm, what we would celebrate as Palm Sunday. Um, he's saying that that would fulfill the 483 years based on uh, Sir Anderson's calculation. Uh, the year 32 AD, uh, based on Luke 3.1 for Jesus' death, is controversial. Uh, most chronolo uh, chronologists favor like 30 or 33 AD, uh, but recent attempts have made some case for that date of 32 AD. Um, there's a, a statement by um, a guy named Showers. He says a recent article attempts to give credence to the date of AD 32 uh, as being the date of Jesus' death. Uh, Walver makes a statement that no one today is able dogmatically um, to declare that Sir Robert Anderson's computations are impossible. Um, but there is, again, a lot of different argument about this. Some have even said the 483 years were completed at the exact day and time of the crucifixion. Um, so you've got a lot of different, different opinions as to exactly when those 483 years are fulfilled. Uh, but regardless of, of how you view that, uh, it is very clear and evident that the first 69 uh, units of seven years, which equal 483 years, uh, have passed. And now there is one additional set of seven years that has to be fulfilled and completed uh, before you know, the second coming of Christ. So this is the the final seven weeks that we're looking at. So if you're going to divide this up, um, it would look like this. 70 weeks um, divided into three parts. Um, seven weeks equals 49 years. Um, so the first week would take place um, 49 years until the city and its walls are rebuilt. That's referring to Jerusalem. And then um, 69 weeks, so that's the seven weeks um, that were referring to here, uh, plus an additional 62 weeks, which equals 483 years uh, from the decree given to rebuild until Messiah the Prince appears. So 483 years total. And then a final 70th week uh, will complete the prophecy. All right, so what that leaves us with is uh, a gap of time between the 69th and the 70th week. All right, so Daniel 9, 26, it's a clear reference to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. If you go to Daniel chapter 9, and we'll look at verse 
26. It says here, after three score and two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself and the people of the prince that shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. All right, so uh, this is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem that happened in 70 AD. Uh, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem. Um, it's evident from Daniel 9, 26 that the Antichrist um, will be of Roman descent because it says the same people. Um, it, it says that uh, the people of the prince that shall come um, shall destroy the city. Some have argued that this would make a strong case for the uh, eventual Antichrist to be of Roman descent. Um, but we have an obvious gap between the 69th week and the 70th week. <clears throat> and that ties into the beginning of these events occurring here in Revelation chapter 6. All right, so let's look at the chapter, um, just kind of verse by verse, go through this and see what we can learn. Uh, let's turn now to uh, the book of Revelation and start reading in Revelation chapter 6. He says, I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, uh, and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. So we'll stop there for a moment. Um, so the first seal is open, and the rider on the white horse that's connected to the first seal is not identified. So uh, it is a wor it's worthy to remark on that or look at that and say that the opening of the seals is not merely a declaration of what God will do, but it is the exhibition of a purpose that is accomplished. Because uh, whenever a seal is opened, the sentence appears to be executed. And that's from a guy named Clark made that statement. So uh, whenever the seal is opened, there is a sentence that is executed. There's judgment that takes place at the opening of each of these seals. Uh, when we look at the first seal and the rider on the horse, it's most likely not Jesus Christ. That would be my opinion, but rather um, the Antichrist. Jesus is going to return on a white horse if you go to Revelation 19.11. And as you go through the book of Revelation, you're going to see many details of the return of Christ that are imitated by the Antichrist. And I, I would look at this and say this is an attempt by the Antichrist to imitate the second coming of Jesus. Um, however you interpret this uh, and whoever you interpret the writer to be, um, to a large extent, it's going to reveal your interpretive grid for uh, the book of Revelation. All right, so those who would see the writer uh, on the white horse at the opening of the first seal as Christ would tend to take more of a historical approach to interpreting Revelation. And those who see the writer as the Antichrist would tend to take more of a futuristic approach to interpreting the book. So it, it, it's going to begin to reveal your interpretive grid um, based on who you interpret the writer to be on that first, uh, the white horse at the opening of that first seal. All right, there's also a connection here between um, Revelation 6 and 2 Thessalonians 2. Um, the first seal seems to be tied into the events described here in 2 Thessalonians, especially uh, when you think about verse 6 and the restraining influence being lifted. Um, there has been an attempt to uh, talk about a connection there uh, by many scholars uh, between 2 Thessalonians 2 and the opening of this first seal. All right, let's jump down to uh, verses 3 and 4, give some commentary on that. The red horse and red rider um, who brings war. Um, it says also the peace of God is taken away in verses 3 and 4. In verses 5 and 6, you have a black horse and a rider who has a pair of scales or balances. Uh, if you think about <clears throat> in 
biblical times, they would have used a set of scales to weigh out goods or, or merchandise to be sold. And he has this pair of scales in his hand. The scales are probably a reference to um, you know, carefully weighing out food or a reference to food being rationed uh, because of um, you know, very difficult or perilous times that are happening uh, with the opening of the seal and the judgment that's taking place. Uh, verses 7 and 8 talk about a pale horse and a rider named Death. So if you go down to verse 7, it says, When he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that set on him was Death. And hell followed with him, and power was given unto him, or unto them over the fourth part of the earth, to kill with sword and with hunger, and with death and with the beast of the earth. Uh, verses 9 through 11, you have the martyrs crying out. Um, this is most likely a representation of all believers who have been martyred for the cause of Christ. Um, you can read about that in uh, 9 through 11. Verses 12 to 17, um, I would see a connection between this and Joel chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, and also Zephaniah 1, 14 to 16, if you want to look at those for reference. Um, Joel 2, 10 and 11, Zephaniah 1, 14 to 16. Um, we should not understand John's description of these events to be scientifically accurate, but they are uh, not to be spiritualized either. Um, something cataclysmic you know, will happen, um, such as has never been before, um, but obviously when we look at the book of Revelation, we understand that there is some uh, degree of symbolism uh, being used here, but verses 12 through 17 talk about uh, the, the depths of the destruction, the extent of the destruction that will happen, and gives us a picture that this is going to be a, a very terrible time um, in which to uh, to live because of the great judgment that is being carried out by uh, by God.